It's 8 p.m. here in Korea. Welcome to our continued coverage of the 2018 local elections. I'm Daniel Che here to keep you updated on how things are shaping up so far. A couple of hours have passed since the polling stations closed. The vote counting is well underway. And to fill us in on the counting procedure, we connect to our Sobo Bin at one of the counting stations. Ho Bin, how are things going right now? It's good to see you again, Daniel. It's been about two hours since the polling station closed at around 6 p.m. As you can see behind me are some 700 volunteers busily counting people's votes. As the vote counting varies by region, hopefully by 10 p.m. we should be able to see some more results taking shape. And to give a brief recap of this year's election, candidates have competed for more than 4,000 local administrative, legislative and educational posts. This also includes 17 metropolitan mayor and provincial governor posts. The election has added meaning since it's the first election under the Moon Jae-in administration. Means it could serve as an indicator of the public sentiment towards the liberal leader's young administration. And as for the ballot counting process, it's going smoothly, but it does involve multiple verification processes to ensure a fair election. Just like many other counting stations, citizens are allowed to oversee the counting procedure up close to ensure integrity and transparency during the process. The ballot counting area, located just a floor below, is under strict control as only the vote counters are allowed to go in. In case of any emergency, police officers are on full standby right outside the counting station. And as for and the National Election Commission is also providing the counting process online by real time as well. Everyone in and around the site seems to be prepared for a long haul tonight. Devin? All right, Fobin, thank you for those updates. We appreciate it. Now we're waiting to see which new representatives will lead each region. We connect to our Kim Mogyeon, who is on standby at the National Assembly for us. Mogyeon, how are candidates and their respective parties handling the pressure so far? Daniel, all parties have been in their respective situation rooms watching the results of the elections um, together from 6 p.m. The atmosphere certainly changed after the results started coming out. Um, when 6 o'clock came around, the results of the exit polls were released. Lawmakers from the Democratic Party of Korea were applauding and cheering. They're on course to win 14 of the 17 leadership posts, that is, governor or mayor of provinces in major cities. Party chair Chu Mie along with floor leader Hong Yong-pyo were smiling and gave a thumbs up as, as those numbers came out. But it was a different scene in the situation room of the main opposition Liberty Korea Party. Quiet and subdued after they appeared to be winning only two of the 17 posts. Chairman Hong Jun-pyo was seen sighing and looking rather disappointed. Hong in fact had promised to resign from his post as, as party leader if they failed to win at least six of the seats. The minor opposition Padan Mita party seemed to be in shock after the exit poll showed their candidate for Seoul mayor finishing third and none of their other mayoral or gubernatorial candidates likely to win. But there's still room for change since the exit polls are not 100 percent accurate and they do not include the results of the early votes cast last week. We should be getting a picture of the actual results at a little past 10 p.m. Korea time and the final numbers including the by-election results are expected to come out after midnight. Daniel. All right, Mogan, thank you for those updates. We appreciate it. Now that ballot counting is underway, it's going to be a pretty intense couple of hours for many people to help us dissect the numbers and give us an overview of what the outcome means for South Korea's political realm. Our political correspondent, Kim Minji, is with us in the studio again. Minji, thank you for joining us again. So what do we have at this moment? Well, Daniel, all the ballots have been cast and a voter turnout tentatively for now is 60.2 percent. Now, the elections have been largely overshadowed by the summit between North Korea and the U.S., but voter turnout is still almost four percentage points higher than the figure back in last um, local elections back in 2014. And actually, it's the first time in over 20 years that the figure has surpassed 60 percent for the local elections. Now, as we've heard our reporters say, it's the first nation wide election under the Moon Jae-in administration, so the outcome is being seen as a barometer of public sentiment toward the government. Now, ballot, 
ballot counting is underway, as we heard, and we will be bringing you details of the figures and who and who the votes went to during our next newscast. But for now, we'll be looking at the exit polls. Now, we can't rely on them for sure, but they do give us an idea of what we can expect. Now, if we start with the race for Seoul mayor, we can see that Park Won-soon of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea is in the lead comfortably with 55.9%. Next up is the race for Busan mayor. Here, Likewise, the ruling party is in the lead with Ugodon with 58.6% according to exit polls. Next up is the Daegu mayor. Here we can see that the main opposition Liberty Korea party Kwon Young Jin is in the lead with 52.2% and Daegu is seen as a conservative stronghold. Next up is the race for Incheon mayor. Here the ruling party is in the lead with 59.3%. For the next region is Gwangju mayor, also a liberal stronghold. Here in the lead is Yong Sap of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea with 83.6%. Next up is the race for Taejeon mayor. Here again, the ruling party in the lead with 60%. Moving on, the race for Ulsan mayor, another conservative stronghold, but in the lead by Song Choro of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, and he overtakes the incumbent mayor, Kim gi Hyun of the Liberty Korea Party. Looking at the next district is Sejong, and the race for mayor here is in the lead by the ruling Democratic Party once again with 72.2%. In other regions, for the Gyeonggi-do province governor, Lee Jae-myung is in the lead with 59.3%, despite being mired in scandal in the last minute. In the next region, Gangwon-do province, the race for governor here, Choi moon soon the incumbent mayor of Gangwon-do province, is in the lead with 66.6%. Moving on to the next district, Chungcheong-bukdo province, here again, the ruling party in the lead, Lee Si-jung, with 65.4%. Moving on, in the Chungcheong Namdo province for governor, the ruling party again in the lead, Yang Sung Jo, with 63.7%. In other districts for the Cholabukdo province, another um, liberal stronghold, the Democratic Party of Korea, in the lead with 75%. In Cholanamdo province, also in the lead, the ruling party candidate with 82%. Moving on. And in Gyeongsangbukdo province, which is also a conservative stronghold, we can see that the main opposition Liberty Korea party in the lead with 54.9%. And moving on to Gyeongsangnamdo province, here also a traditional conservative stronghold, but led by a ruling party candidate, Kim Gyeongsu, with 56.8%. Also here, despite being marred in a scandal um, regarding online opinion rigging. Moving on. In Jeju-do province, Won Yi ryong who is an independent candidate and the incumbent mayor of Jeju with 50.3%. Now we're going to move on for the exit polls for the by-elections. In Seoul's no one si district, we can also see that the ruling party is in the lead with 60.9%. Running up is a candidate from the Paramita party. In Seoul's Hongpa B district, we can see that Choi Jae-sang of the ruling Democratic Party of Korea is in a comfortable lead with 57.2% and he is trailed by the conservative candidate Pei Hyun Jin, who was an anchor at MBC with 28.2%. In Busan's Haeundae B district, we can see that the ruling party candidate is also in a safe lead with 54.4%. Moving on. In Incheon Namdong A district, we can also see that the ruling party is in the lead with 65.9%. In other districts, the Gwangju Sa A district, the Song Suk of the ruling party is in the lead with 85.1%. In Ulsan's Puk district, we can see that the ruling party is also in the lead, 52.2%, despite being a conservative stronghold. In other regions, the Chuncheongbukdo Chechon Tanyang district, here it's a very tight race. We can see that the gap between the two is less than two percentage points. So we will have to take a close look here. In Chungcheongnamdo province, Cheonan A district, the ruling party is in the lead, Lee Gyu Hee, with 56.8%. In Chungcheong Namdo Chanan C district, again the ruling party in the lead was 65.9%. And Cholan Namdo Yongnam Buwan Shinan district, also, also a liberal stronghold rather, in the lead ruling party 
uh, ruling Democratic Party of Korea, Seo Samsak with 72.4%. And Gyeongsangbuk-do province here in Kimcheon, we can see that the main opposition Liberty Korea Party, Song eun Suk, is in the lead with 55.1%. And uh, final, po final opinion polls released last week actually showed that the independent candidate was in the lead, but today exit polls show the opposite. And in Gyeongsangnam-do Kimebi district, again, the ruling Democratic Party in the lead was 68.5%. Yeah, the conservative bloc looking a little bit shaky in their usual home turf there, and not much of a nail-biter so far for the Liberty Korea, uh, rather the Democratic Party. Yeah, so the exit polls have been more or less in line with the final opinion polls that were released last Wednesday. Now, for the local elections, uh, we saw that the ruling Democratic Party of Korea is actually in the lead in 14 of 17 metropolitan cities or provinces. And something to note is that they have overtaken their conservative counterparts in conservative strongholds. Now, for the main opposition, Liberty Korea Party, it's in the lead in two districts at the moment, Daegu and Gyeongsangbuk-do province. Initially, it had aimed to win at least six positions. And as we heard in our previous newscast that the chief of the main opposition party said he would take responsibility for the results. So we will have to see what he means by that. And lastly, an independent candidate is leading in Jeju, the province. He, was, he is the incumbent governor of Jeju and initially a lawmaker of the centrist Padamida party, but he left the party before the elections. So the race for mayor and governor is actually seen as mainly a race between the two biggest parties. Right, uh, two biggest parties. Uh, interestingly, I was hoping for the, uh, the respective uh, top honchos of the ruling bloc and the main opposition to perhaps uh, throw out a, a few pledges, uh, something drastic if the, uh, uh, the, the voter turnout reached beyond 60%, but I believe they did not do that this time. They did it for the early voting, though. Yes. Well, regardless, uh, could there have been any other variables at play affecting the races up to this point? Well, this time around, what political pundits have said that there is a distinctive factor different from um, previous elections in that people want to show their support for the government's peace initiative, um, given the recent developments with North Korea. So the latest developments on the peninsula, no doubt, have played a favorable factor for the ruling party, as we can see. And as it's the first nationwide election, we thought that more people would be assessing the government's failures and successes, but obviously, we can see that the main opposition party hasn't positioned itself too well to become a strong alternative. So not many variables remain that could turn things around at the last minute. Some factors that experts said was allegations regarding the candidates themselves or voter turnout as well as undecided voters to having key to having a change or impact on the outcome. Because opinion polls actually showed that between 20 and 40 percent of people were undecided about who to vote. And there's also a block of voters known as shy conservatives, those who don't tell pollsters that they actually support the main opposition, Liberty Korea Party, given their tainted image following the ousting of a former president. The possible X factor that the Liberty Korea Party is constantly counting on at this point. Well, regardless of some of the, I mean, unfortunately, we had to mention the, the facts that some of the, uh, the Democratic Party candidates were mired in scandals that arose while they were running for these positions. But it seems like they are rather unfazed or rather their followers are not exactly uh, thrown off by these allegations so far. Yes, what um, political experts have said that because it involves the candidates themselves, at the moment they want to give their support for the party as a whole. So they were saying the last minute allegations regarding these um, candidates wouldn't have had too big of an effect. And especially because the elections came a day after the summit between North Korea and the U.S., that would have overshadowed most of the big issues that were coming from the political scene. Right, so far, the voters are understanding the whole is greater than the sum of all its parts. And naturally, the emotion of uh, disappointment towards the Liberty Korea Party and the previous conservative uh, establishments, because they are still remembering clearly uh, the first ever impeachment of a democratically elected South Korean president. That's right. So what experts have said was rather if the Liberty Korea Party had positioned itself in a better position, um, actually saying that the ruling party was doing a good job in certain affairs and then also raising other issues such as like the economy being in the doldrums and things like this then it would have been 
they're saying that the polls could have been a little bit more favorable towards the main opposition party. Right, they seemed a bit lost at this point as to what they should focus on instead of being all over the place or being on the defensive end. Right, Minji, we'll right. get back to you in a, in a bit with more updates and of course for your analysis of the situation. Uh, we'll talk to you in, in, a, in a bit. But for now, uh, we are going to turn to another expert that's joining us on the table. It's time for us to further dissect the developments. To help us do that, we have a Professor Huang Myungjin of Korea University joining us in the studio. Dr. Huang, thank you so much for making time for us. Thanks for coming, for inviting me. Right. right. First, first of all, I think the Kim Trump summit mm -hmm. sort of stole the thunder a little bit from the election. Sure. Well, uh, I think the, the, it's obvious that the benefits goes to the support of the Democratic Party, as you know, the vote uh, turned out to be, you know. Uh, it's kind of a massive massacre for the opposite parties and supporters because, you know, they have no, well, the, the vote results might be pretty much expected, but the, the margin is quite surprisingly higher than uh, ex, uh, the expert, uh, most experts uh, expected. So that's kind of, you know, a big thing. And the Trump effect is, uh, um, we are not quite sure about it. You know, maybe in the further analysis might have to, been uh, investigation, but uh, for sure this at least that doesn't really undermine the you know vic victory of the you know Democratic Party. Okay, so was it a source of distraction or a reinforcement? These big events happening while exactly a day before the actual election date. Uh, from now on, I believe it's quite big support and reinforcement rather than you know uh, distractions for the ruling Democratic Party. Yes, uh, for the Hong Jin person and other the opposite party, that's quite big uh, distraction because you know they could not raise any issues other than you know the scandal and the, you know disclosure and uh, some negative uh, campaign. And they weren't very supportive of the movement to open up for dialogue with North Korea. And uh, during the inter-Korean summit as well, uh, it turns out that uh, the Liberty Korea Party wasn't exactly responding to it in a positive way as many in Korea did. I guess it's major failure of the opposite party. Not only that they uh, effectively uh, providing campaign against it, they failed to get into that as a partner of the whole dialogues and you know the force massive forces that you know people might be more interested in the you know nuclear uh, issues and North Korea and uh, U.S. summit. So. Right. Uh, it's, if you can't beat them, you got to join them at certain times strategically, exactly. but they failed to see that uh, logic. Uh, going back to the inter-Korean summit, what impact did it have in the long haul from uh, April 27th when that event was held, when they shook hands? How did it affect voters, in your opinion? Uh, voters, I think they can be stick with the, the, you know, the issues and then uh, democratic parties uh, have uh, continuously uh, provide, you know, progressive and uh, uh, more you know, labor-friendly uh, uh, policies, and then uh, many, uh, especially economic uh, areas, experts uh, have, you know, raises many uh, questions and uh, issues. But you know, that doesn't really affect you know many voters, especially uh, uh, young and uh, the progressive uh, support people. So uh, the many things might affect, but you know, you know the. The North Korea and uh, the, the U.S. summit has some, you know, bonding effect of the all things all together to support or help the or benefit for the uh, Democratic Party. Right. Just a couple of years ago, uh, the nation came together. A lot of the people in the country came together mm -hmm. to speak up against a flawed government mm -hmm. uh, to impeach. President Bakune. It was the first ever impeachment in mm -hmm. Korean history of a democratically elected leader. Mm -hmm. Is there still a spillover, a continuation of the candlelight vigil spirit in terms of voters' uh, a sentiment towards who they want to pick? I think so. This is uh, the moment that we uh, acknowledge that uh, our continuous uh, uh, reforms and uh, changes progressively into the uh, future is, uh, has not been changed. Uh, one of small evidences of those who are very close to Park Geun-hye's uh, inner circle, you know, power elite group, for instance, Yoo jong Bok, so, so byung and Kim Tae-ho, they, they've lost quite, you know, with big margin. That's the one uh, evidence that people still remember that those who are uh, working with the Park Geun-hye administration might be out of our political, you know, 
League. Right, they might be out of touch with the political league and the voters as well. Uh, what about uh, some people seeing this not just as an election to rate President Moon Jae-in and his government's performance, but rather sending a clear message to the previous, uh, the party that used to be uh, where Park Geun-hye used to belong to? Oh, I think the people still want that, uh, you know, more uh, regretful and, um, uh, what you must say, the apologies. Uh, well, those actions might have been shown from the, you know, currently opposite party, but still people are not really satisfied with this paper. So I think the, this might be the sad news for, for the opposite party, but they have to think about why they have this kind of result. It's not about, you know, the Moon Jae-in and the current uh, ruling Democratic Party did anything right or wrong, but it's about that they haven't changed it at all. So might be from a moment that they have to think about and the one, one, one uh, biggest uh, mistake is you know ancient regimes old power elite people are still running for the you know the, the local the, the election that really give distress satisfactions for the you know voters this is what happened i think help us show the balance between these two factors the uh, the liberals the liberal size hard work it's a su successful performance, or is it the conservatives' failure to move on or change? Which is the bigger factor here? I think the, I agree with the first part, because uh, Moon Jae-in administration just took the administration just for one year. It's too soon to make any evaluation or judgment. We have to look into what's going to happen in the future, and continuous uh, progressive policy in taken, you know, and uh, it's, uh, for instance, uh, labor market uh, reform and, uh, you know, some uh, jobless ownership uh, might have to change it. And uh, social justice and uh, maybe uh, equal development of regions and uh, gender equality, it has to be uh, move, moving on towards, that's what many people uh, think and they vote for the Democratic Party candidate. There have been so many things going on uh, during the election or leading up to the election, uh, the Drew King scandal, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, the critical, the criticism from Hong Jun-pyo regarding the, the way the survey is conducted mm -hmm. uh, before the election and the bandwagon effect mm -hmm. uh, because we have surveys being conducted through cell phones and landline and there's a difference between that and also the anti-graph law, it may have impacted how uh, the, the candidates campaign. How would you rate some of the uh, X factors in the election here? You raised too many issues. Well, from my understanding, as the current ruling party's vic victory may give them uh, wrong messages, because uh, some ethical issues, morality issues, those has been still unclear, and then they have to, uh, not effectively, but you know, righteously, defend their position. Uh, a couple of, at least, a couple of the candidates who obviously won the election. They're not really uh, free from any more judgment by the people. Even if they won, you know, the election with a big margin, that does not mean people are really satisfied with everything they did, what they will do in the potential. So uh, a ruling party might have to think about whether their uh, victory is what they have done right, or people still have, even though despite many factors that worry people, people still want to support them to move on to the, you know, progressive, the, and also, you know, country's reunification. So in some sense, they must realize uh, they have to earn the trust of the people, even now from here on, still. Otherwise, they will have big losses from the next election. That's what people are taking, you know, paying attention to, you know, the next move of the current ruling party. Right, letting them know, hinting them that they will not just sit idly by mm -hmm. while things go around around them, and certainly they'll have to make sure uh, right. they have a sense of awareness. There are some unique elements to Korean election campaigning. Moving on to some uh, lighter topics, mm -hmm. uh, songs, dance, uh, campaign trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe uh, South Korea's? Uh, uh, campaigning or election mood or the atmosphere or the culture compared to other countries? Well, for me, it's, it's quite uh, entertaining. You know, many, many people, you know, it's not about the major TVs and, you know, 
you know, the massive, the, you know, expensive the program you know, campaign. But my reason, you know, you know, local elections is very funny. You know, young people wearing the same uniform and they, you know, walk and move and then dance and that really pleased many people and that gives new energy for people and then that's another evidence that people need to change this country from the uh, political areas. So it gives a good energy for the older people and then people are really happy whether they, they're, you know, they're supporting people won the election or not. Right, it gets the people involved, engaged, and it adds a personal touch to it and a mm -hmm. uniquely Korean flavor, you might add. But of course, there were some restrictions here due to uh, some of the uh, scandal that was going on, as we previously mentioned. And even for the campaigners, they had to be careful of the major changes with the anti graft law in place. Uh, that I don't think much about it. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, let me change the topic. Uh, my, my son is only uh, seven years old, he's in elementary school. Uh, boy, and uh, he asked me this morning, who, you, who did you vote? And then, yes, I did, and then, who did you vote for? And, you know, thinking about this kid's uh, mindset, I think sometimes the uh, Korean people are too much political. And then that's, you know, people try to uh, change things in their living styles and life uh, patterns uh, solely through the, the you know, political elections. Uh, I think that's my, we might have to change the thing because, you know, uh, whichever person got a party won the election or vote, that does not really directly affect your mindset of so your life and your, you know, relationship with your, your family and then your community. Right, there are certain rigid formats that we, we might have to move out of mm -hmm. to make some changes for the future generations. So I want to focus on uh, uh, the Liberty Korea Party's Hong Jun Pyo, the mm -hmm. chair. He's been quite a controversial figure with his uh, comments mm -hmm. and uh, certain moves that he made, and it seems to be a bit aggressive, according to some, internally or externally. Mm -hmm. What can we make of him? Well, um, sorry for him, but I stopped paying attention to him because, you know, he just talk and uh, it's like he says, he says, and people don't care much about it. The thing, the next move that he has to really think about is how he can combine and integrate the, or scatter the conservative parties and people. And uh, there are, you know, you know the good people and bad people in all around the world and different, you know, political the spectrum, but, the, you know, they are good, and uh, you know the, those sincere people who really think about you know the future of this country and uh, for the next generation. And then, because of Hong Junpei and the old ancient region, people are still holding you know the powers of the, you know those uh, limited power. But that the prohibit the young peoples you know moving into and joining the you know conservative areas. And so I think. He really has to think about his future with the old conservative, you know, party support people. Is there a movement of uh, the conservative blocs trying to distance themselves from mm. uh, Chairman Hong? Well, that's their decision, but uh, for, this is my personal opinion. But uh, maybe they have to divide and uh, integrating, you know, uh, things uh, uh, on and on. So maybe who knows in the future, but. Uh, the the Liberty Korean Party might have to, uh, to shut down, and uh, the new newer people will come. The problem is that we haven't seen a new faces for this conservative party. And it's been you know this is really good opportunity because you know the uh, changing you know old subject uh, that we had uh, we felt problem from the the last Lee uh, Lee Myung Bak and the uh, Park Geun administration we say we feel sorry about it and uh, this is how we go with this new face and new people this is really good momentum and opportunity and they didn't really listen to you know what people really are sincerely asking for so you know this uh, opposite party might have to think about you know they are not the you know the possessing power any longer they have to be more challenges and more reformative. That's right. how it, we They do not seem to have a clear mm -hmm. sense of awareness of where they stand, mm -hmm. that they're down, they need to find a way mm -hmm. up. Uh, and you have uh, two ears and one mouth, so you should listen more. 
That's what some salesmen would say. Uh, th in Korea, there's a tendency for a lot of uh, political parties to suddenly change their name. Oh. Uh, is there a reason, is there a rationale behind this? It seems like a recurring pattern. Well, that causes many problems for me because I cannot remember and you know, memorize all new ch you know, changes name. Well, basic idea is a two party plus you know small uh, uh, progressive and liberal and more conservative party might be always happening, even if they change his name. Uh, comparing to my uh, college years, uh, thirty some years ago, those you know the congressmen and uh, or the poor elite people are still remain the same. They only change the name and you know their houses and colors. You know, we, we, we see, you know, each election time, we see new uh, colors of uh, windbreakers. That really uh, make things funky. So uh, from now on, I really hope that conservative and uh, uh, liberal and uh, uh, progressive party might have to stick with, you know, what they are. Right. Um, going back to you, Minji. I have one question. Uh, there is a need for a change, uh, reinvent themselves. We have a tendency to dwell and sort of be stagnated, especially when it comes to political realms. Uh, what, would you, what would you see going up for the Liberty Korea Party as well as the Democratic Party? They cannot be complacent anymore. Well, if it's a landslide for the ruling party, it also means a devastating loss for the main opposition. The ruling party initially aimed to win at least nine districts in the, mayor, the race for mayor and governor, while the main opposition wanted to win at least six, but that hasn't been the case, obviously. So this might lead to some serious political reshuffling, and that could come in the form of a change in party leadership or forming a coalition of some sort or even lead to defections to other parties. So some parties will not look as if they are now, as we see them now. Such a result would be good for the ruling party now that it would be easier to get President Moon Jae-in's policy agendas rolling across all four co corners of the country should his party take up most of the regions. But like experts have said, it's important to keep a balance between the two parties. Um, like the professor said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ruling party has been doing a good job. So we will have to see how that turns out. And it's likewise for parliament as well. The ruling party is on track to adding 10 more parliamentary seats and giving um, the 128 seats in parliament, as long, uh, along with other liberal parties in, in the parliament, would give it a more bigger say. And the main opposition and centrist parties may have difficulty keeping the government in check or preventing any um, bills that they don't like to get passed. Right, we've been hearing about reforms and reviving the economy for so many years, but not much substance so far. It, perhaps it's, it's because they've been not been given the chance to uh, try and fail and try again, whether they're from the conservative or the liberal bloc. Right, going back to you, Professor Wonfo, for one last question before we wrap things up. Uh, what about the lesser known parties and the lesser known independent candidates? Are they being given enough opportunities? Is there a, is there, is there a flaw in the system where uh, not everyone gets an equal say or equal time in the spotlight? Small parties and uh, independent uh, candidates, uh, they might have to be, you know, really uh, complain about this uh, current uh, setting and situation Richard's coming. Because you know they never have chance to speak out and speak up. Because uh, many issues are covered by you know North Korea and uh, the U.S. summit, and uh, uh, small issues but important issues. This is local election, the locality, and many issues has not been listened, uh, you know, spoke by the you know small party and the liberal party. So we have to think about you know, why this is happening. Is that because of the election system or just happened for now because it, this is how society is uh, moving. But still, sorry for you know, small party people. Right. Many people talk the talk about understanding their local districts and the uh, local culture, but few people can walk the walk. So perhaps uh, the other smaller candidates will be given the uh, greater opportunities in the near future. Professor, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks for having me. And Minji, of course, uh, we will continue to have our discussions and continue to dissect the development later on. Thank you.
Regarding the heated debate about President Trump's Tuesday remarks, Seoul's top office took a cautious stance, urging the media not to jump to any conclusions. As a more detailed response on the outcome of the summit will be provided after President Moon Jae-in shares the National Security Council meeting tomorrow. The Chongwan stress the government will do its best to continue the momentum of dialogue. Hwang wo has the latest from the presidential office. A day after U.S. President Donald Trump said he would halt the South Korea-U.S. joint military exercises, calling them, quote, expensive and provocative war games, South Korea's top office was wary of drawing any hasty conclusions. According to Kim yi gyum the Blue House spokesperson, the presidential office's official stance for now is to try and figure out President Trump's exact intentions, but to assist in any way possible to advance dialogue for peace and denuclearization in various ways, hinting that a suspension of the joint drills with the U.S. West might not be out of the question. A Blue House official confirmed that President Moon will convene a full meeting of the National Security Council on Thursday to consider what exactly President Trump was referring to when he said, quote, war games, whether it's the Allies' usual drills or something else. They'll also evaluate the outcome of the Singapore summit as well as discuss follow-up measures to implement the agreement reached by Trump and Kim Jong-un. The director of national security, Chong Wu Yong, usually presides over meetings of the standing committee of the National Security Council, but the South Korean president will chair an all-member meeting when deemed necessary. Thursday will be a hectic day for the Blue House because aside from the NSC meeting, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is set to visit President Moon to personally brief him on the results of the North Korea-U.S. summit. Pompeo's visit will fulfill the promise of President Trump made during the 20-minute phone call with President Moon on the eve of the Singapore summit. Also visiting the South Korean president is Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono on Thursday afternoon. Pompeo and Kono are scheduled to hold a three-way meeting with South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang Yong hwa on the same day. Hong ho Jun, Arirang News. So what are some South Korean experts making of the summit agreement and what should we expect from now on? A couple of analysts held a forum in Singapore on Wednesday. Oh jung -hee has the highlights from that session. The joint statement by North Korea and the U.S. was pretty short and lacked the details that many had expected, but we should look at the bigger picture. That's what some South Korean experts pointed out at a forum on Wednesday at Korea Press Center in Singapore. They said the summit was successful in setting up the foundations of what's to come, and they expect to see the specifics laid out through working-level discussions. This is only the beginning of a long denuclearization process coming after 70 years of hostility between North Korea and the U.S. North Korea developed its nuclear weapons mainly because of its hostile relations with the U.S. The Cold War system surrounding the Korean Peninsula is pretty much because of the two's hostilities. So with that agreement on Tuesday, North Korea will seek to secure its regime through its relations with the U.S., not nuclear weapons. To make a change, they added, the leaders of Pyongyang and Washington have decided to first trust each other rather than push each other to verify the final result. The two leaders have broken the conventional concept of having to verify something in order to gain trust. The conclusion they reached on Tuesday is to trust first and then test whether trusting each other is a right choice. And it seems Kim Jong-un is eager to gain trust. Ahead of his talks with Trump on Tuesday, Kim said he came here, quote, overcoming the wrong prejudices and conventions of the past. Kim said there have been good agreements in the past that weren't carried out properly. He's stressing that he won't make the same mistake. He laid out a self-reflection of the North Korean regime. He wanted to send the message that he's different from his predecessors and has a strong will to implement the agreement. The experts pointed out that now that the North Korea-U.S. summit is over, South Korea has an even greater role than before the summit. It's time for South Korean President Moon Jae-in to take the lead in the three-way structure. The summit agreement reaffirms the Panmunjom Declaration. North Korea's denuclearization is a crucial starting point for working towards peace on the Korean Peninsula, but it's definitely not the whole of it. South Korea will have to take a leading role in the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Woo Jong-hee, Arirang News, Singapore. 
The summit of the century came to a close yesterday, but it still remains one of the hottest topics around the world. For a look at how media in different countries, uh, corners, corners of the globe rather, reported on it and how they rate the outcome of that meeting, we turn to our Yi Ji Wan. As a historic moment in history, the Kim Jong-un Trump summit attracted huge attention from the press with three major media centers set up in Singapore. But just like different countries have different stakes in the summit, the international media have taken different views of it and highlighted different things. Many in the Chinese media are very positive about this summit. Their main focus was the denuclearization program. Since China is a neighbor of both Koreas and a possible nuclear bomb or a war is very threatening to China as well. True, while it was light on details, I think this represents an overall positive uh, in U.S.-North Korea relations with really, which haven't existed before. Japanese media, including NHK and Nihon Geizai Shimbun, focused on the abductee issue that was mentioned at the summit according to President Trump. They expressed hope that the issue would be resolved and how important it is to Japan's prime minister, who is facing political problems at home. But there were also media skeptical of the result as well. The Washington Post reported that the summit was a huge success for the North Korean leader, claiming that President Trump made huge concessions to Kim. CNN focused on the military pullback Trump had mentioned as something he would do in the future. Quoting experts, CNN said the move was a unilateral decision that alarmed America's allies, namely South Korea and Japan. And there were also many divided reports on the summit from media within the same country. One is South Korea, one of the greatest stakeholders in the latest developments. The series of rapid diplomatic changes is unprecedented and it cannot be understood in the framework of the past. So many South Korean reporters seem to have had difficulty dissecting the summit, and the different political colors their media have could come into play when they look at these events. While many South Korean media were positive and hopeful about the results of the summit, some also raised concerns about Trump's military pullback and skepticism about why North Korea's denuclearization has not been spelled out with the phrase completely, verifiably and irreversibly. Many in the global media have pointed out that lack of detail and vague wording. But with efforts to implement the deal to start soon, we'll find out whether this was because the two leaders trust each other, as Trump says, or it was because they disagreed. Lee ji Arirang News, Singapore. And this is where we have to wrap things up for now, but do keep it tuned to Arirang as our coverage of the 2018 local election continues. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with more at 10 p.m. Korea time.